My heart felt like it was about to beat out of my chest as I anxiously awaited the starting pistol. I took one last glance at the other boys at the starting line around me and I thought to myself, I've got this. I was running the 400 meter race at our sixth grade cluster track meet. I mean, the stakes, they don't get any higher than this. And I knew deep down inside I could win. And so the gun goes off, race starts, and I shoot out of the starting line like I'd been launched out of a cannon. And I take off and I'm in the lead. And I go around that first corner and, and I see the other, other runners behind me and I am just flying, I'm humming along. I get to the midpoint of the race, still in the lead, and I'm thinking to myself, I'm gonna win this thing. And it wasn't until I get to the last turn that something strange started happening. I had heard about this before, but I had never experienced it until then. They, they called it hitting the wall. And it literally felt like I hit a wall. My legs just stopped working. It was like my brain was saying go, but my legs just flat out said, no, we're on strike. And, and I still remember what it felt like to watch runner by runner pass by me as I just struggled to get across the finish line. You wanna talk about a humbling experience. Uh, that was my first real lesson in endurance. And I learned shortly after that, that endurance is something that has to be trained in order to be gained. Muscles have to be broken down and then built back up stronger if they are going to last for the long haul. The same is true when it comes to cultivating consistent Christ-like character and a pure unmixed heart. James puts it this way. He says, consider it a great joy, my brothers, when you experience various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. But endurance, it must do its complete work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. It's surprising to me that, that a book that has a reputation for being all about works begins not with a command to change what you do, but instead to change how you think. I mean, consider, in other words, take a look at things and think about them this way. And James says, consider it a great joy whenever you experience various trials. Now, hold, hold up. Does James have any idea who he is talking to here? I mean, these are Christians who had been forced to, to flee from their homes, uh, to flee from their country. They were refugees, strangers living in, in foreign territory, most likely serving as migrant workers, being treated like scum, I mean, continually exploited and oppressed and, and underpaid. They, they knew what it was like to unfairly go without being paid. They, there were days when they were unable to feed their families. And I just want for you to take a minute and think about this. Can you imagine this, what it would be like? Imagine. I mean, being able to remember a time, I mean, not too long ago, where you enjoyed security and a degree of comfort and freedom, and then all of the sudden having it stripped away. Forced to, I guess, what must have felt like a hopeless situation, just trying to survive from day to day. And it's to these people that James said, have joy, and not just any type of joy, pure joy joy that's not mixed with anything else. Had James lost his mind? I mean, was he being unrealistic? Or maybe he was just being insensitive? Was he playing the role of annoying cheerleader, just telling them to, to turn their frowns upside down and just, just pretend everything is great? No, James, he wasn't telling them to be happy about the terrible things that had happened to them as as if it were even possible to order someone to feel a certain way. But instead, he's instructing them to consider things from a different perspective. 
James uh, encouraged these hurting brothers and sisters of his to, to look at their circumstances through the lens of heaven. He gave them a message, and that message remains the same for us today. It's this, that the road to possessing a pure heart involves encountering and overcoming trials. I mean, there's no way around it. I wanna say that again. The road to possessing a pure heart involves encountering and overcoming trials. Just like developing physical endurance requires our bodies to be resisted and strained to grow stronger, building spiritual endurance, it also involves facing and fighting through struggles that challenge our, our faith in Jesus and our faithfulness to him. And it's, it's through becoming kingdom-minded people who treasure the eternal over the temporary, where we are able to find joy in the midst of our trials because we, we understand that they accomplish and they push us forward towards what is most valuable in life, possessing a heart just like his. And as we look at James's words, I think it's important to note that he, he's not commanding us to take joy in our trials, but to take joy in what God can and will do with them and through them through all the various hardships that we face, whether it's an earth-shattering, terrible tragedy, or simply just the daily irritations and worries and struggles that just seem to continually eat away at us, God can use all these things to complete you and me and make us more and more like Jesus. And as we said last time, there is nothing that is better than this. Now, this doesn't mean that, that we pretend to enjoy the things in our lives that cause us to suffer and to struggle. It doesn't mean that we ignore or, or put a mask over the anger and sadness uh, or the frustration that we might be feeling. What it does mean, though, is that we can take joy. Joy in the fact that God can use every frustrating and difficult and terrible trial that comes into our lives to prepare us for more meaningful and ultimate things that he has planned for us. And for those of us who have given our allegiance to Jesus, each trial we face tests our trust in God. That word tested is really a fascinating word. It, it was used to refer to the purity and genuineness of a, a precious metal. And so the refiner, he would take valuable metal that was, that was mixed with other worth worthless waste products, and he would heat it all up to really extreme temperatures. And that precious metal, it would melt, and as it liquefied, the solid impurities would rise to the top. Those impurities were called dross, and the refiner, he would skim it off the top, and he would take that dross away. And, and this process, it would be repeated over and over and over until the metal was considered to be tested or pure. And the way that the refiner knew that the metal was tested and that it was unmixed with anything else it wasn't supposed to be was that he could look into the metal and clearly see his reflection in it. Like that impure metal, you and I as believers, we possess hearts that are a, a mixture of both treasure and trash. We have God's spirit implanted in our hearts, and yet we also have a lot of junk that's mixed in as well, that, that just is totally repulsive to God. We have remnants of our old self that needs to be revealed and removed and then replaced with the nature of Jesus. And often in our lives, it takes turning up the, the heat of our circumstances to get that ugly stuff inside of us to rise to the surface. At, at least that's what I've discovered in my own life. You see, when I feel comfortable and safe and secure. I really, I don't have any issues remaining committed to Jesus. As long as the situations in my life stay under like a certain threshold, I, I don't have any problems feeling connected with him or even going to him for wisdom and guidance. I, I don't struggle to demonstrate Christ-like patience and character, but I have a breaking point. I think maybe you do too. See, when the things in my life feel like they're becoming overwhelming, 
when they feel like they're outside of my control. I, I often over and over revert back to myself and, and my strategies for dealing with things and making it through. I mean, forget prayer. You know, they're, when the, the heat gets turned up, I, I've got to step in and take charge. I've got to take over. And so I, I worry and I become self-centered and I get angry to get my way and I get frustrated easily and I lack patience and I lose sight of what's important and I begin prioritizing the urgent over the important. And I often try to find ways to escape my situation. Can you relate to this on any level? It's the heat and the pressure that brings out the dross within me. And when these trials arise, and they happen often, each trial tests the genuineness of my faith, or really more often than not, the, the lack of genuineness. But it provides God with an opportunity to reveal and remove the impurities within me so that my heart can become more refined. And you and I, we have to be refined over and over if we ever hope to become purified. The process of refinement, it, it's never easy, but it's where we acquire endurance. And, and this picture of endurance that we have here in James, it, it, it involves the ability to remain under a heavy load for a long time. In other words, when life becomes difficult and overwhelming, and out of control, when your life is completely turned upside down and the world around you feels like it's pressing in on you, how do you respond? I mean, do you, do you crumble under the weight of circumstances? Do you act less like Christ and more like your old self? Or are you able to live and love well and, and demonstrate pure, Christ-like character, even when the heat around you is turned up. Spiritual endurance, it's not given to us at the moment that we become believers. Instead, like physical endurance, spiritual endurance has to be trained in order to be gained. And it, it, it's acquired gradually, often painfully, and with a lot of moments of stumbling and failure. And spiritual endurance, it's not cultivated from the comfort of a couch, but instead in the crucible of hardship. And unlike physical endurance, which is often associated with this pull yourself up from the bootstraps type of grit that's able to just trudge through tough times, spiritual endurance, it demands just the opposite. It's not developed by charging ahead in your own power, but through recognizing our, our desperation and our need for God. Spiritual endurance, it requires learned dependence. It only comes through recognizing our, our need and Christ's strength and then choosing to just hold on to Jesus throughout all the trials of life. And although we may falter and we may stumble quite a bit, the life of endurance, it's marked by a continual and consistent desire pursuit and undivided commitment to Jesus. And this is how we know that endurance is at work in our lives, because the fruit of endurance is a heart that grows pure and more unmixed over time. Until, as James says, endurance does its complete work so that you and I may be mature and complete, lacking nothing.